Uh, I'm going to talk about something that I think is not often discussed with the public regarding physics, and that is the really like the nuts and bolts of how exactly we use the technology available to us to do science. So that means my goal today is basically to explain to you why I think the picture on the left is really cool. Uh, but first, you'll have to let me reminisce about my office life a bit, because I just defended it all. So, you might be surprised to learn that I work in a building with a lot of people who do things that are very different from what I do. So, most of my day-to-day -day work is like coding at a desk, but I have friends who work in labs, setting up experiments, and I have friends who pull their hair out, like working next to a chalkboard. And even though we all do very different things, the thing that we all have in common is that we all pull our hair out. And, uh, okay, well, not just that, but also the ultimate goal with all of our work is to develop models that describe the natural world. And the purpose of the models we're trying to develop is twofold. First of all, we want to have a systematic way to describe the things that we see in nature. And we also want to be able to predict things that might happen in the future or things that we might not have been aware of before that we could observe. So gravity is one of the oldest things in physics and we've been trying to develop models for it for literally hundreds of years. And we've settled on basically two models that we use in practice. And the first is what you might have learned about in high school called Newtonian mechanics. And the basic idea is that all stuff attracts other stuff. And the strength of the pull that stuff exerts on other things only depends on how much stuff there is and how far apart the stuff is. So for a model, it's actually very simple to work with. Maybe, maybe not like to learn about, but at least in terms of like practically doing math with it, etc. And Newtonian gravity is actually very old. It was first published in the 1600s, and we still use it today because it's very useful. And for a physics theory, that's very impressive. But sometimes Newtonian mechanics isn't enough. And when it's not, then we use general relativity, which is one of the theories that makes grad students cry, and also the reason that Einstein is so famous. Or well, at least one of the reasons. There's like a million reasons. But the idea with general relativity is it's a totally different paradigm from Newtonian gravity because it conceptualizes gravity as being the shape of the fabric of space-time. So time and the three spatial dimensions essentially make up a geometric object. So time and the three spatial dimensions are no longer totally independent things. And the shape of the surface basically dictates how objects and also light move. So one of the interesting things about general relativity is that unlike Newtonian gravity, it predicts the existence of black holes. And black holes by themselves don't actually do a whole lot, but we're very interested in them because they do a lot of different things in the various environments that they can be found in. So just for some examples, they can rip stars apart, they can launch jets of matter at relativistic speeds very fast. Uh, they can gather disks of matter around them, and uh, also they spin, so that's kind of cool. Uh, but I'm going to be focused on one of the only things that I think is crazier than one black hole, and that will be two black holes. <laughs> so I'm about to show you a simulation that my group developed, not me personally, but people in my group, and it will show you what happens when you have two black holes in orbit with each other. So right now, it might not look like much is happening because these two black holes are moving in a very similar fashion to how planets or stars in orbiting would move. 
But as you watch this, you may notice that they're actually gradually becoming closer to each other. And eventually, they're going to collide and form a single black hole. I'll let it finish. <laughs> it's like reverse twins or something. <laughs> and uh, if you have sharp eyes, you may notice that there is also gravitational lensing around the black holes, so they're bending light around them, which means you can actually see the things that are behind them. Now, physicists are very interested in these because as they're orbiting, they radiate what are called gravitational waves. And gravitational waves are basically ripples in the fabric that I was talking about earlier. So what that actually means is basically it could change the length between things. Like if you have a round bracelet with beads on it, kind of like in the figure on the right, and a gravitational wave passed through it, then it would change the distance that the beads are separated by. And we can actually detect these gravitational waves using experiments on Earth, such as LIGO. And these experiments are some of the most sensitive instruments that we have ever built. So the thing that people usually say is that they're sensitive to like the length of a proton or a fraction of a proton. Uh, one of my friends told me recently that they're sensitive to the storms in the Gulf of Mexico for something that's a little bit more concrete. So uh, I think the LIGO and also similar laser interferometer experiments are actually one of the most impressive things humanity has built. They're up there with like rocket ships that can go to space and stuff. And so that's why we're treating them with the respect that they deserve and we're probably defunding them. <laughs> yeah. Boo. <laughs> Call your rep. Okay. So, <laughs> so when we detect signals in a gravitational wave experiment, we don't actually immediately know what the source is. So, so we need a way to match the signal that we see from uh, whatever source it came from. And as you can imagine, this is a little bit of a complicated problem. So the way we do this is we use general relativity to produce predicted signals, that is to say, we simulate signals that we expect to see, and then we try to match these signals with the measurements we make through experiments. But where do those predictions come from? They are very challenging to make um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, unlike in Newtonian gravity, where if you're worried about the gravity between two objects, you only have to worry about gravity at the location of those two objects. In general relativity, we have to worry about the entire space-time around the black holes. And so that's already like an ex a huge layer of complication. But the actual math involved in the theory of general relativity is also extremely complicated and tedious to do by hand. And it's a rite of passage for every grad student who takes a general relativity class to stay up until 3 a.m. doing the math on pen and paper, uh, regretting their life decisions, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't do it by hand if we can help it. And actually, there are very few problems that we can actually solve by hand. So instead, we use supercomputers. And if you don't know what a supercomputer is, you can basically imagine taking a thousand laptops and putting them all together in a room and making them work on a group project together. So these are vastly more powerful than the kind of computer you can buy for personal use. But even though supercomputers are very powerful, they also have limitations in what they can do because there is a cap on how many operations they can do per second, and they have a limited amount of storage available, etc. Uh, this 
is a photo of a supercomputer that some of my colleagues use. And if you want an idea of how much data a supercomputer can actually store, uh, this one in particular can store all 20 million Marvel movies, if you really wanted it to. <laughs> so it is a lot of space, but a simulation of a black hole will also take up a lot of space. And we don't have an infinite amount of storage or resources. And actually, supercomputer resources are the biggest expense for groups like mine, or at least one of the biggest expenses. I guess I, I don't know all the details. But uh, it's very important to us to be efficient with our resources. So even though we need to tell a computer that we plan to use to simulate a black hole collision about the entire space-time around it, we're not necessarily going to have room to encode information about everything that's going on in the space-time, because that would not be very cost-effective. And so our solution is basically to only use information from a few points inside the space-time. So you could imagine like covering the space of the black hole system with a grid and then like picking the points on those grids for the data that you need. And uh, this is actually a very sophisticated problem because the placement of the points is very important. First of all, there's the question of how many points you need. And the problem is that if you have too few points on your grid, then you won't be able to resolve the features that you're actually interested in. But if you put too many points, they'll all be very close together and uh, your simulation will never end because it'll just take a very long time because you'll have a lot of operations to do and I won't get my PhD. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, the placement of these points is sort of a balancing act between the high accuracy that we need uh, versus the cost limitations that we're forced to work with because we have finite resources. So I'll show you what these grids look like when we do strike that balance. And this is a very cool visual made by somebody in my group. And on the top is what the grids of the simulation look like in real time, and on the bottom is basically a representation of how strong the space time is. So I will play it for you, and uh, all right, so uh, I want you to mostly pay attention to the left. Um, you don't have to worry about the right. The right is basically like what the points would look like from a different perspective. But on the left, you'll notice that the grid points are actually moving with the black holes. So they're actually tracking the motion of the orbit. And another thing that you might notice is that this isn't like a square grid with everything evenly distributed. Uh, you can see that the grid kind of like makes different shapes. So they're, like the domain has a lot of layers. And also the placement of the points follows the symmetry that's in the system. So you wouldn't want to put a square grid on something that's round because that's actually going to make a lot of extra work for you. And so another trick that we need to use is to make sure we shape our grid to take advantage of the symmetry that we have in the system. So uh, I think it's really profound that we can use a computer that only understands discrete things to represent things that are actually inherently smooth. And uh, I have only touched the surface of how much work goes into these simulations. Because to put it into perspective, general relativity, the theory was published in 1915. And our first simulation of a black hole binary, or the, you know, the thing I've been talking about, that was finished in 2005. So it took 90 years for people to figure out how to do that. And uh, the way we do that is by using a lot of clever techniques, like some of the ones that I just showed you. 
So I hope now uh, you have a little bit of appreciation for how it's important for us to understand the tools we're using to be able to do science. And thank you so much for your attention.